or hopefully this mic uh, works out for me this talk, I tend to walk around a lot. If I get too quiet for anyone, just stick your hands up and I'll start shouting a little louder. I could ad lib, do some stand up. Cool, right, there we go. Um, right, thank you everyone. Um, this is actually my third time in Ghent. Who here is from right here in Ghent? Cool, lots of us. A beautiful, beautiful city. It's an absolute privilege to be back here for a third time. Um, the food, the drink, the architecture, the history, the culture, the tech scene, absolutely amazing. It's a real honor to be actually opening this, this two days of, uh, of Front End United. I'm sure you've all looked at your, uh, sort of the, the booklets. We're in for an absolute treat, some really fantastic sounding talks. Uh, I get to start with mine. Uh, which is CSS for software engineers for CSS developers. Uh, do we have any back-end developers or software engineers in the crowd? Okay, a few of us, so thank you because I've stolen a lot of your work for this. Uh, front-end developers, front-end developers in the crowd, mainly front-end developers. Cool, so what we're gonna be looking at is taking software engineering principles, um, old-school traditional design patterns and paradigms from computer science, and applying those either directly or indirectly to CSS. Um, the reason for the recursive title is that we're not writing CSS for software engineers. We're writing CSS from the point of view of a software engineer so that our own work as front-end developers can be more effective, pragmatic. Uh, we can work more productively, much faster. So we're gonna be looking at some fairly in-depth, specific design patterns, paradigms, principles from the world of computer science. Uh, before we dive into that, I just want to start with a real brief history lesson, a very, very brief history lesson. And that history lesson starts with these two. Uh, this is my mother and father uh, on their wedding day in 1984. Uh, and these two are really important to me. Uh, of course, obviously, they're my parents, really important for that. But um, they provide me with a very sort of specific, slightly obscure professional, personal benchmark, a sort of a personal timeline. And that timeline stems from the fact that these two were both born in 1959. So, as well as being the birth year of my parents, 1959 was also widely regarded as being the birth year of the first modern programming language. Uh, obviously quite a contentious issue, uh, the first, you know, it's hard to define the first modern programming language, uh, but it's widely regarded as being a language called Flowmatic. Uh, the reason that people say that Flowmatic was the first, uh, it was fully electronic and it was the first language that used English-like words to manipulate data. So instead of being zeros and ones, machine-looking code, it was actually uh, developed using English-like uh, language so that we could manipulate data, much how we manipulate data today. Uh, it was developed by a woman called Grace Hopper. Who's heard of Grace Hopper? Show of hands. Nowhere near enough people, right? You all need to research Grace Hopper. She's a very, very important woman. She uh, did a lot of very pioneering work uh, in the early days of computer science, the early days of uh, software engineering. She did a lot of work for the US military and, uh, and she was responsible for developing Flowmatic between the years 1955 and 59. So it took quite a long time, as, yeah, as you can imagine, writing the first ever programming language probably wasn't a quick job. Uh, but by 1959, she had a prototype. She had a working version of Flowmatic out there and being used. And Flowmatic then went on to inspire languages like COBOL and Fortran. It's a very important piece of work. Um, and it's really interesting for me to know that for, uh, Flowmatic is basically the same age as my mother and father. What that does is it gives me a really, really good benchmark for the work that I do. I can understand in much better context uh, sort of the work of software engineers. Modern computer science is roughly the same age as my parents. Um, on the subject of Grace Hopper, actually, if anybody has ever seen any of her sort of YouTube uh, archival footage, you probably get the impression she's a bit of a badass, right? She's got a very can-do attitude. Uh, nothing represents that better than this for me. This is an excerpt from the Wikipedia page for Flowmatic. Basically, Grace Hopper suggested the idea of this, uh, this, this programming language to her bosses, her managers, and they just didn't even think it was possible. They just kind of wrote off the idea as not doable, and instead of being disheartened or let down or discouraged, Grace just rolled up her sleeves and did it anyway. Uh, and I really admire that, and that's why we've got, you know, that's why we ended up with Flowmatic. So in the wider context, what this basically tells me or gives me is this, this personal timeline that I mentioned. Uh, it puts in the, into context the work that I do or that we do as front-end developers uh, in the grand scheme of things, right? The, our context in the wider picture of, of modern computer science. 59, Flowmatic, my parents. Uh, 1990, I came along. 
1996, uh, my youngest sister and uh, CSS. My sister doesn't actually know that this slide is in this talk. Uh, I find it quite interesting that my sister started off her life as a small, fat man. Um, <laughs> oh, she's going to kill me for that. Um, but basically, uh, Flowmatic and my parents, the exact same age, uh, CSS and my youngest sister, the exact same age. And this is a very, very personal benchmark of mine. This timeline doesn't work for most people in the audience. But looking at things in this kind of context makes me realize just how short a time uh, my work has been around, right? CSS has been around for a blink of an eye in the context of older and more traditional computer science. We've got this huge gap. This, it's actually a 38-year gap. Uh, sorry, 37 and a bit year gap uh, between the first modern programming language and CSS. Now, unfortunately, CSS developers only, have only recently started talking about things like architecture, performance, scalability, uh, like it's a brand new problem, right? But it's been a problem since the 50s. Computer scientists and software engineers have been solving problems like this since the very beginning. We've got this massive, rich chunk of history, this 37-year chunk of history that we can look to to steal paradigms or patterns. We can borrow different principles and apply that to our work. And that's exactly what we're going to do through this talk. We're going to look at some very specific principles, paradigms, design patterns, and look at how we can apply them either directly or indirectly to CSS. So the first principle we're going to look at is the dry principle. Who's heard of dry? Yeah, most of us, right? So don't repeat yourself. Uh, it's the sort of... Um, <laughs> Do you want me to say it again for you, Chris? Um, so dry is a principle around maintaining code bases. It's a maintenance principle. We will look at some of the confusion around dry. Um, and the single source of truth. Who's heard of the single source of truth? OK, fewer hands. I kind of expect that. The single source of truth I see as being a more philosophical uh, paradigm that sits behind dry. Dry is what we do, and a single source of truth is what we get. So basically, uh, in short, every piece of knowledge must have a single, unambiguous, authoritative representation within a system. Uh, just don't write the same thing twice. Uh, I'm going to skip back, actually, because there's a really important word on this slide which I've actually neglected to highlight. Uh, that word is knowledge, right? So it's not about not repeating anything. This is one of the parts of uh, confusion around the dry principle. Dry is not don't repeat anything at all. It's about avoiding the repetition of key bits of knowledge, key bits of information. Uh, we'll look at how that can be problematic in a few slides' time. So every piece of information should exist only once. Uh, you shouldn't need to make the same change several times. Has anybody ever inherited a project where uh, you need to make a modification, you, cha you change something, and you refresh the browser and nothing happens, and then you learn that, oh, crap, right, that was actually defined in another place. I need to change it twice. Has anybody ever had that happen to them? Yeah, it's just annoying, right? There's, n there's no other word for it. It's just, it's just a pain in the ass to have to work in that kind of environment. The dry principle is not about small file sizes. It's not designed for performance. The dry principle is purely a maintenance principle. It leads to smaller file sizes. Ultimately, it leads to better quality code. But first and foremost, the dry principle is all about easing the cost of maintenance. It reduces our cognitive overhead. Um, and uh, non-dry code, or wet code, uh, contributes to bloat, right? We've got bigger systems than we need to manage. Looking at a real simple example of some CSS, we've probably all seen a CSS like this at some point, just some utility classes for nudging around our kind of our margins. Um, but the problem is we've written this 12 pixels four times. Uh, 12 pixels here is knowledge. It's key bits of information. This number is 12 for a reason. I would posit that our baseline grid is probably 12 pixels. That's why all of these values are the same. But the fact we've written it four times means that if our baseline grid changes to 18 pixels, we've got to change it in four places. Or even worse, we forget that we have to change it in four places, and we get one 18 pixels and three 12 pixels. This leads to disparity and, uh, and inconsistency throughout a code base, which then is the start of a downward spiral. We don't understand what's going on in the system that we're maintaining, and it just gets more and more difficult. So the absolute most simple example of dry applied to CSS that I could think of was just using a preprocessor, right? Sticking that 12 pixels somewhere in a variable, and that variable becomes the single source of truth that we mentioned. So the act of using a variable is to dry our code. What that leaves us with is a single source of truth. This unit, this dollar unit variable, is a single source of truth that represents that knowledge. Slightly more complex example. Uh, we've got three completely unrelated rule sets here. These rule sets have nothing to do with each other. But they've got these thematically related declarations, right? We've got a custom font and a custom or a specific font weight. Whenever we apply this font, 
it needs to be rendered font weight 700. The problem here is, if we were to change the custom font that we're using, we're gonna have to go through and change that 700 in every single location. Um, the way of drying this out, or the best way to dry this out, would be to use an argumentless mix-in. Now, has anybody ever heard the saying, argumentless mix-ins are bad? Has anybody ever heard that? A couple of hands in the audience. Um, a lot of people say that using a mix-in that doesn't have an argument in it is, is bad because it just generates a lot of repetition, right? It just creates the exact same lines of code over and over again without any difference. Uh, it just contributes to bloated software and it, it makes things uh, sort of, uh, sort of very, uh, makes things very repetitive. Uh, this is kind of a bit of fool's gold, right? That's not quite the right bit of advice. Uh, dry isn't about small file sizes. That's part of the confusion we need to avoid. Dry is about avoiding repeating manual work. So using an argu argumentless mix-in just acts as like a sassy copy and paste. Uh, it gives the exact same output, right? We're not actually getting any file size saving by doing this. We're not getting any performance wins. What we're getting is just ease of maintenance. So don't worry about generating repetition. Generating repetition is completely fine. Dry is all about re uh, avoiding repeating yourself. Uh, moving on to the single source of truth then, it's the practice of structuring information so that it exists only once, right? So the single source of truth is just that one point in your project, in your code base, uh, that defines the, the one and only instance of a certain bit of information. Uh, the more philosophical principle behind dry, um, key data should uh, exist only once, and this in turn increases our confidence. It's so much easier to work with a system when we know that every single thing is defined only once. We know that every change is very specific and it will propagate through. Uh, it just keeps things tidier and makes things much simpler to work with. So if you dry out your code, you are ending up with single sources of truth. Okay, so um, confusion around the dry principle then. I see people very, very frequently taking the dry principle way too far. Uh, dry in source, not in production. Don't care too much about generating repetition. The whole point is that we're not repeating ourselves. Writing a mix-in that will spit the same thing out 50 times is completely fine. Writing that same 50 things manually is a problem. Uh, it's not about avoiding repetition completely, it's about avoiding, repetition your, uh, avoiding repeating yourself. I wrote um, a bit of an article on this. I won't read this slide out to you because that'll be quite dull. Uh, there's a full article on this, when to use extends, when to use mix-ins, and it kind of combats that opinion of argumentless mixings being bad. Uh, the key takeaway here is uh, of don't manually type anything. If, you simply think, if something does need to be repeated, write something that will spit it out for you. Um, another problem with the dry principle is that people try and dry out absolutely everything. So we've got font weight bold here, three different instances, but it's purely coincidental. These three, these three rule sets that we're looking at have nothing to do with each other. They're not related in any way whatsoever. Um, a lot of people, a lot of, uh, sort of frameworks start to use extends in SAS or start to write funny kind of source-ordered CSS in order to avoid repeating font weight bold at all. Um, people advocate for writing font weight bold once in a style sheet and then tying every selector to that. The problem here is it just creates really awkward uh, relationships in your CSS. These declarations have nothing to do with each other. Font weight bold being repeated three times, entirely coincidental. To draw an abstraction around this makes much more complex CSS. So don't dry anything out if it's repeated entirely coincidentally. Uh, repetition in compiled code is fine. Uh, going too far creates real awkward relationships and abstractions that are harder to, harder to debug, harder to understand, and harder to move around. So to wrap the first one up, uh, dry in, uh, so use a preprocessor to dry things out, the simplest bit of advice. Uh, use mix-ins to repeat uh, sort of lengthy bits of CSS, multiple declarations. Um, the move towards design libraries, uh, style guides, object-oriented CSS means that we can actually dry out our visual uh, components. We can actually uh, reuse bits of UI. Uh, don't dry anything that is purely coincidental. And there's a really nice saying in computer science that repetition is better than the wrong abstraction. I would rather have to change something in three places than pick apart a really complex series of SAS extends or pick apart a really complex mix-in. Repetition is better than the wrong abstraction. Okay, the single responsibility principle. Who's heard of this one? Oh, a few of us. The single responsibility principle of all the principles in this slide deck is probably the most effective one. If you were to implement just one of them, make it this one. The single responsibility principle is very simple. Uh, it's kind of uh, most basic. Um, but it really gives us a lot of runway for making very complex uh, bits of UI very, very quickly. 
Uh, there's a long dictionary definition for the single responsibility principle. Um, basically, it states, do one thing, one thing only, but make sure you do that one thing very, very well. It breaks big monolithic tasks or jobs or features down into tiny, tiny composable bits of, uh, of information or instruction. Um, this makes things much easier to understand, right? Rather than reading a big, complex bunch of code, you can read tiny, tiny little bits that get pieced back together. It makes things much easier to understand, to pick apart, to modify, to extend, and it gives us very, very high composition. Uh, if you've heard of composition over inheritance, uh, that's basically the embodiment of, of the single responsibility principle. Now, there's actually a surprisingly good real-world metaphor for the single responsibility principle. That is Subway, the sandwich restaurant. Restaurant. Um, Subway apply the single responsibility principle to food really, really well. That's because when we go to Subway, we don't order a sandwich. We are presented with the ingredients. We put the sandwich together ourselves. Subway took the idea of this monolithic sandwich, um, which is going to be the name of my new band. Uh, they take the idea of this monolithic sandwich and break it down into tiny, tiny bits of ingredients that you can piece together in any combination you want. Uh, for me, this is the epitome of the single responsibility principle. This is the best real-world example that I can think of. I go through this example with clients and workshop attendees all the time because it really reframes the way we think about uh, sort of single responsibility principle and monoliths. Break big things down into their smallest possible parts and ensure that each part fulfills its job very, very well. Uh, the single responsibility principle is all about dealing with one job. The other kind of definition of the single responsibility principle is single reason to change. Uh, reason to change is basically any bit of functionality that uh, a piece of code has. Uh, there, should only be, there should only be one reason to ever change that functionality. We'll see a good example of that in a couple of slides' time. By having these tiny little composable bits of instructions or ingredients, we can combine and compose things really, really well. It gives us incredible opportunity and flexibility. So much so that at Subway, you can make 6,442,450,944 different sandwiches. Uh, all of them taste identical, but you can make 6.4 billion sandwiches at Subway. Someone's done the math. If you follow that URL at the bottom, somebody dedicated some time to working this out. Uh, but it's true. You can make 6.4 different, uh, 6.4 billion different sandwiches just by providing people with the ingredients. That amount of flexibility and composition is really, really powerful. Uh, let's look at this metaphor in a little more detail, right? So if we built this, this monolithic sandwich, um, this is really hard to modify. Uh, if a vegetarian wants to eat this sandwich, they're really going to struggle because we can't do anything to change this. Uh, we can extend it a little bit. We could add things in by using inheritance. Uh, but this is fairly monolithic. This is very, very opinionated. Very hard to change, very hard to work with, very inflexible. Uh, if we just rewrite this as its ingredients, if we break this sandwich out into single responsibilities, we can make the exact same sandwich again by using composition. What this gives us is uh, much more scope for removing things, adding things, changing things, swapping things. Um, I don't really like tomato in my sandwiches. It makes the bread soggy. Don't know why you would want that. I get rid of it. It's really, really easy to combine and compose things in the UI or in the DOM uh, by adhering to the single responsibility principle. We can make the exact same sandwich as before, but we've given ourselves a lot of opportunity to modify, extend it, change it. So if you work in a team, if you work with other developers, uh, try as hard as you can to provide those developers with the ingredients. Right? Don't give them the sandwiches. Don't give them the finished meals. Give them the ingredients to make the meals themselves. It will mean that they can combine and compose things very, very quickly without being annoyed or frustrated by overly opinionated code. Uh, to look at a more realistic example, um, I see CSS like this all the time, right? We've got this uh, login button. There's a, there's a, there are a few things wrong with this. The first thing, button login, isn't a very good name for a, uh, for a class because we've tied ourselves to one specific use case. We can only use this to log into something now. Uh, the other problem is we're mixing responsibilities. We can identify three separate responsibilities here. These are three separate reasons to change. The first is our base responsibilities, just setting up the display context for a button. Uh, next, we've got some structural responsibility, saying that it's going to have this padding. And finally, we've got cosmetic responsibility. We're deciding now how this cosmetically will appear. There are three different responsibilities. There are three separate reasons to change. They should exist as three different separate pieces. So we just split this out into tiny, composable, single responsibilities. This is a much nicer way of working, because we can rebuild that exact same button from before, 
but in a number of different contexts, and the size is completely optional, the color is completely optional. Uh, this is the single responsibility principle, and we can, we can sort of extrapolate and, and extend this into suites of buttons. Now, we've probably all seen this before. This is a very, very common practice nowadays, but it's a much, much nicer way of working. Uh, when you're refactoring any CSS, try and identify numerous responsibilities within a rule set, and that is your first port of call, right? When you're refactoring, try and pick apart these big rule sets into the much smaller ones. Very closely linked to the single responsibility principle is the separation of concerns. Who's heard of the separation of concerns? Oh, quite a lot of us. This is a really interesting principle. When I did the research for this talk, I actually learned a little more than I, than I realized. A separation of concerns does not exist for the sake of good quality code. Uh, that's something we get kind of by accident. The separation of concerns is actually there for the sake of developers. It's there for the sake of being able to understand programs more easily. If you hit the Wikipedia page for the separation of concerns, there's a really nice, very eloquent, uh, quite wordy, but very, very beautifully written uh, description. Again, I'm not going to read this slide out to you. It's very boring. Basically, what it says is everything should be responsible for itself and nothing more. The example given on Wikipedia is that um, we should be able to study a program on Monday and look purely at that program's syntax, right? We should be able to study just the syntax and ignore everything else. So what the, single uh, sorry, what the separation of concerns is about is training ourselves to not have to worry about other things. We should look at just the syntax on Monday, and that's it. Then on Tuesday, perhaps we study the features of the program. We should be able to ignore the syntax. We should be able to ignore the performance of the program, because on Tuesday, we are only interested in the syntax. Then on Wednesday, perhaps we study the performance of the program. We should be able to ignore the features, the functionality, the syntax. It compartmentalizes everything, so we can study features and study aspects in complete isolation gives us confidence when modifying code because it means that we can work on one aspect of it without having to worry about affecting anything else by accident. Again, we'll look at some more examples of this. Uh, in CSS, um, simple examples would be only bind CSS onto CSS-based classes. Uh, don't write any CSS against a JS hyphen class, for example. That's a JavaScript hook. It shouldn't exist in a style sheet. Uh, don't write CSS selectors that look like HTML. A selector like header, UL, LI, A, that's putting a lot of DOM information straight into our style sheet. It means that we can't worry about our styling without also having to be aware of the semantic decisions that we made. Uh, don't bind CSS onto data attributes. And I would argue, don't bind a JavaScript onto data attributes. Data attributes exist to carry data. They're not a hook. They're not for styling. They're not for behavior. Data attributes exist to hold data. Don't hang your uh, styling off of your data layer. And similarly, don't bind JS onto CSS classes. Uh, the amount of times I've refactored CSS to find that changing a class has broken some JavaScript, I shouldn't have to worry about JavaScript when I'm refactoring CSS. In a little more detail then, uh, the top one, I'm sure we've all seen selectors like this before. In fact, we've probably written a selector like this at some point. The problem with a selector like this is it's using a, an Araya role, right? Araya has nothing to do with CSS, it has literally nothing to do with styling. That kind of selector does not belong in our style sheets. Uh, the second one, putting DOM information into our, into our CSS completely violates the separation of concerns. A lot of people argue that putting classes in your markup breaks the separation of concerns because you're putting style information in your HTML. To get around that, you have to write a selector like this, which just puts all your HTML information into your style sheet. So this also breaks the, uh, the separation of concerns. I cannot refactor my HTML without having to also worry about the CSS now. I've kind of muddied the waters, and I have to be concerned about two things. Uh, the third one, many of you may not even recognize this, right? About 10 years ago, we actually used to use HTML to provide styling. Uh, this is one of the key reasons CSS was even invented, because we shouldn't have our content layer also responsible for our styling. We should keep the two separate so that we can have our content in one place, our styles in another, so it's easy to maintain, more accessible. Uh, and the final one, real simple, binding JavaScript onto a CSS class is very risky, right? We shouldn't, be able, or we shouldn't have to worry about our JavaScript when we are refactoring stuff to do with styling. Take the top example a little further. Uh, as responsible front-end developers, we should all write our markup first. Always write your markup first. And we lean back and we think, right, built a nice semantic accessible navigation. Uh, next, I'm going to style this thing up. And conveniently, there's a hook already in the HTML waiting for me. So we pop open a style sheet, and we start writing CSS like this. This is really bad. We have just started filling our style sheet with DOM information. 
uh, we're referencing uh, accessibility hints, array roles. We're also refer referencing a specific DOM structure that we can't always guarantee. Uh, this is a really, really bad way of working. The, the, the way we should have written this, the kind of alternative method, is quite a departure. Uh, it's quite significantly different, and it usually kind of shocks and surprises people, but the way we should have written our HTML is actually a little more like this. That's much larger, but we're going to step through exactly why we chose and made these decisions. When we deal with the separation of concerns, remember it's about what we focus on at any given time. We should be able to focus on one thing at once and not have to worry about anything else. So the first decision that we should make is, what are the semantics of this bit of the DOM, right? Semantically, I'm deciding that I'm gonna use a nav element with ULs, allies, right? Nice and semantic. Once I've made my semantic decision, I should be able to forget all about it and move on. I should not be concerned with this anymore. This is a solved problem at this point. So I step forward and I make my accessibility decision. I decide that I'm gonna to signal to assistive technologies that this part of the DOM is for navigation. I ignore the semantics completely. I'm not concerned with how this behaves or looks, because right now my single concern is how does this behave, right? How, does this, um, how is this going to present itself to assistive technologies? Once I've made that decision, I can forget that it even happened, move on to the next thing, which is my stylistic concern. I can decide that, well, regardless of the semantics used, regardless of the elements used, I want this piece of UI to look like this. And then finally, we step through to our behavioral concern. And at this point, we decide that, well, Despite all those other decisions I've made, I now needs to act like this. Perhaps it's a, a responsive navigation that hides off of the side of the uh, screen uh, on, on small devices, right? By writing our CSS, or, sorry, our HTML like this, every single concern has its own unique hook. It means that we can have complete separation. It means that I could refactor the semantics used in this bit of UI without having to worry at all whether it still looks the same. I could trim this bit of HTML down, get rid of the ULs and allies, and just go for a nav element with nested A elements. I should be able to do that without once having to worry about my CSS breaking. I should be able to choose uh, what I signal to assistive technology. I, I should be able to change my array roles if necessary without once having to worry about whether that breaks my CSS. I should be able to refactor how the JavaScript acts on this bit of UI without having to worry about the semantics of that bit of UI. So the separation of concerns just means it's uh, a lot less overhead when modifying or extending or working with existing code. It means that we can work in completely sandboxed, isolated compartments, very safe in the knowledge that we're not going to accidentally break something completely unrelated. I actually did this exact example with a client a couple of years ago, uh, well, a year and a bit ago, and their first sort of comment was, yeah, this is way more HTML. Like, surely, surely that's bad for performance. Um, so this is kind of a, a good point, I guess. So I did some uh, tests. After you've gzipped and minified this bit of HTML, uh, the difference is around 48 bytes. Uh, I think 48 bytes is a very, very worthy spend when you consider just what flexibility and uh, maintainability this approach gives you. If you worry about file size with stuff like this, uh, firstly, thank you for worrying about performance. Secondly, over pure text like this, it's nothing to worry about. 48 bytes is the cost of this. What that buys us is a far more flexible and maintainable system. Um, some of the good examples of this uh, separation of concerns, grid systems, right? And I'm talking HTML grid systems, div class equals row, div class equals column. Uh, they're a little unconventional, they're a little ugly, uh, they're often deemed insemantic, uh, but they're a great example of the separation of concerns. Our components should not be responsible for laying themselves out. It would be a very sort of inflexible system if our nav always had a width attached to it or if our sidebar always had a float left applied to it. By using a grid system in our HTML, we can completely extract the layout concern away from our components, which makes them much more flexible and easy to reuse. Um, conversely, writing CSS in JavaScript, a very sort of topical uh, discussion right now, uh, this breaks the separation of concerns. As soon as we start putting our CSS into our JavaScript, we can't reconsider our JS architecture without also having to reconsider our CSS architecture at the same time. They should be nicely decoupled. Writing CSS in JavaScript completely breaks that separation of concerns. Uh, a guy called Keith Grant put it way better than I ever could. Uh, if in 14 months you find a new view library or framework that you want to try out, you're out of luck. Uh, you'll have to invest a lot of time into pulling styles back out of JavaScript and into style sheets again. Keeping things nicely decoupled means that we are free to change our minds. We could choose a new JavaScript library and we should be able to keep the exact same CSS. 
bundling everything in together means that we ha we've lost that opportunity, we've lost that flexibility. Immutability, who's heard of this one? Oh, a handful. Um, so immutability is a really interesting one at the moment, especially if you're interested in functional programming. Immutability deals with uh, mutations or the lack thereof. And a mutation is basically a thing changing state throughout a program. An immutable object is an object whose state cannot be modified after it has been created. This is a really, really nice way of working. Uh, unfortunately, CSS is almost designed entirely around mutations. Uh, but an, an, an immutable object is an object whose state cannot be changed after we have created it. This gives us incredible confidence. If we know that any time we look at a variable or a class or a declaration, if we know that every time we look at it, it will always be exactly the same, it makes it very easy to understand, very easy to debug. It makes things very, very easy to work with. It gives us a lot of confidence. Uh, it reduces cognitive overhead. So if you've got a thing that can be mutated, if you've got a class that can be mutated, you have to remember how it behaves in certain contexts. Uh, M's in CSS, a very controversial one, but uh, M's are a terrible example of, of mutation because an M is always different depending on how and where you view it. It's a very mutable state. An M could be 20 pixels over here, it could be 16 down there, it could be 12 over here. You have to remember the context that you're working in before that value makes sense. We'll look at some more specific examples of mutations in CSS and how to solve them, but basically immutability removes caveats and conditions. It makes things much simpler to understand. Very, very consistent. Uh, we've probably all seen CSS like this before. Um, simple grid system, call six is 50%. We've got a 12 column grid system, call six is half of that. We've then got this very opinionated decision that says on a smaller screen, we're just gonna collapse everything into one column. On a smaller screen, call six is width 100%. Now, the problem is this is a mutation. Call six has one input, call six, but two outputs. It's either 100% or 50%, depending how and when we observe it. This is a very tricky way of working and not particularly nice. We have to memorize a lot of stuff here. Times this uh, by 12 for all the columns in your grid system. Times this by every other bit of responsive stuff we've got going on in the project. That's a lot of stuff we have to memorize. So the problem here, yeah, uh, call six has one input, two outputs. Uh, we have to memorize that, and the outcome depends on how and when we observe it. Uh, mutable state leads to confusion, uh, weird side effects, right? We have to memorize the different side effects that might happen if we use something in a different context. Uh, and unfortunately, it's really common in CSS. Uh, responsive design uh, is a wonderful, uh, wonderful approach to building websites. But from a purely technical point of view, it's all designed around mutation. It's all designed around mutating how things behave. It makes things very difficult to debug. The way I solve this in responsive world is just to use a different class. This at sm on the end, a responsive suffix, just says well, call six is this, but call six at small is this. Don't worry too much about this making sense right now. I will share a link to the article that discusses how this works. Uh, but this is all about uh, lack of mutability, right? This is uh, creating immutable classes by using two of them. Another example, um, subcontent h2. Uh, and text center, these two, two selectors here, uh, and this bit of HTML. Now, if you look at this, you may have noticed there's a problem. Uh, we've actually got a specificity mismatch. The selector subcontent h2 has a higher specificity than text center, which means that the h2 in the HTML is actually text align left. So despite being explicitly told to be text align center, uh, this renders completely differently. This, again, is a mutation. This is a troublesome, pesky bit of CSS. Because CSS operates in a global namespace, completely unrelated parts of the project can modify each other. Mutation can happen all across your project because of this global namespace. It gives us unpredictable outcomes, uh, unexpected side effects. I would not expect a class of text center to render something text align left. Uh, but fortunately, this is fixable as well. The fix is very unconventional. Please don't throw anything at me. Stick an important on there. Oh, no, no. Well, it's going crazy. Right, stick an important on there. Um, never use important in anger. It's a very important caveat I need to put out there. Um, never use important to solve an existing problem, right? But using it proactively on helper classes, utility classes, is a very good way of guaranteeing immutability. We don't ever want text center to do anything other than text align center. We never want that. So this is a very safe place to stick an important in there. So any utility classes, things like float left, text center, font size large, any of your helper classes or utility classes, 
put an important on them because it guarantees that we will never get this specificity mismatch and ensure that we are gonna get uh, immutable CSS. Uh, another example of mutations in CSS is nesting, right? Nesting is really bad in CSS. Um, what we're doing is we're mutating button. Button exists once uh, in every context, but specifically when it's in a promotional area, uh, it changes, right? We've mutated how button behaves. Button has one input, two outputs. This is a mutation. Solving this is really, really simple. Instead of nesting this selector, create a modifier for it. Those of you familiar with BEM will know that button dash dash large simply makes any button larger. Now we've got two classes. We're not modifying button at all. We're actually extending it by using a modifier. Uh, this is no longer a mutation. This is an extension. So don't have several states of the same thing. Uh, immutability is a really good programming concept in terms of like variables and, and sort of functions and that kind of stuff. But applied to CSS, it's about forcing immutability, important on utility classes, uh, using BEM modifiers or responsive suffixes to provide variations rather than, uh, rather than nesting, for example. It's all about removing these states, these caveats and conditions, which brings us nicely onto the next principle, uh, that of cyclomatic complexity. Who's heard of cyclomatic complexity? Okay, a few people. Uh, I'm kind of cheating right now because cyclomatic complexity technically isn't a principle. It's a form of static analysis. Cyclomatic complexity basically takes a bit of software, it could just be a function, and it runs some analysis over it, and it tells us how complex that function, for example, is. Uh, it counts the number of ifs and elses on a very basic level. It counts the number of ifs and elses, the number of independent paths on a decision tree, the number of branches on a decision tree, so if we've got a function that's got like, if this, do this, otherwise do this, otherwise do this, otherwise do this, otherwise do this, every if else counts towards that bit of uh, code's cyclomatic complexity. Uh, there's actually an equation for working out cyclomatic complexity, but I have no idea what it does. All we have to remember is that the more ifs and elses we have in a bit of, so uh, bit of software, a bit of code, the higher our cyclomatic complexity. And unsurprisingly, higher complexity is bad. We want to keep things as simple as possible. Uh, people often say that CSS doesn't have any logic. Uh, CSS isn't a programming language, that is true. Uh, but if we look at CSS in a certain light, we can see that it's actually got a lot of logic baked into it right since the beginning. If we, if we take a selector like this, uh, and again, we've probably all seen selectors like this before, there are a lot of ifs and elses in this selector because basically what we're saying to the browser is, if you find a div with a class of main, if you find a section with a class of content, if you find an h1 with an a with a span, then do this. Uh, and actually, because browsers read selectors right to left, we're actually doing it this way around. If you find a span in an A and so on and so on, all of these if statements are a chance for something to go wrong. All of these if statements are a chance for the browser to not match. Um, when I go through this stuff with clients and workshop attendees, I train people to look at selectors in two distinct parts. First, we have the subject. That's the only bit we really care about. That's the bit we want to style. That's the bit we want to find. This is the only really important bit of this selector because all of this is just complexity. All of this is narrowing down that search. The problem we've got here is we started off with a very, very broad subject. Just find a span is gonna match a lot of the DOM. Because that was such a broad subject, we have to then write all of this to narrow that down. We have to say, well, actually, if this, and if this, and if this, all the way up to seven if statements, then we get a match. This is bad CSS. This is way too verbose. It's way too long-winded. Instead, we should start off with a much more explicit subject. Swap out that span just for a text highlight class, for example. So using extra classes in your CSS allows you to reduce cyclomatic complexity. There's only one chance for this to fail. We either have used the class in our HTML or we haven't. So nesting and qualifying selectors is really bad for cyclomatic complexity. It increases it. Uh, they carry a higher cyclomatic complexity that we want to keep low as possible. We want to keep our cyclomatic complexity as low as possible for a number of reasons. It makes things simpler to understand. It makes things much more uh, robust. If we have deeply nested selectors, we are inviting more chances for something to go wrong. Also, it just increases file sizes and all that bad stuff. Uh, got an actual example of this. Um, this is from a site that a friend of mine built about six years ago. My friend knows I use this slide, so I'm not just being a dick. Um, I'm a bit being a dick, but not just. He knows I use this. This is a really good example of going crazy with preprocessors, right? You know, when you start using preprocessors and you nest everything to the top level of the DOM, uh, it leads to this crazy high cyclomatic complexity. This is a really bad way of working. Uh, luckily, we're moving away from this. We've realized that, you know, perhaps using SAS this much is a bad idea. Um, but actually debugging this site for my friend, I learned, something, I learned something quite interesting. I learned that 
If you delete all that, it still works. So a lot of the time, the complexity that we add to our CSS is just complete dead weight. It's completely unnecessary. Um, all that stuff that's got a strike through, that was increasing specificity. Uh, it was reducing our sort of portability. It was increasing cyclomatic complexity, and it was increasing file size. Right? It doesn't really count for much, but if all of your CSS is written like that, think about how much dead weight we've got in that style sheet. So try and keep cyclomatic complexity as low as possible in your CSS just by using shorter selectors. Uh, the next one, the open-close principle, who's heard of this one? Okay, a few of us. Uh, the open-close principle is really, really good. Uh, unfortunately, it's really badly named because 50% of the useful information is missing from the title. Um, the open-close principle states that software entities should be open for extension but closed for modification. You have to, you have to memorize which way around it goes because it's not in the title. Um, does anybody here work with legacy CSS or in teams with existing CSS? Uh, yeah, okay, it's useful for about 15 of you. Um, this is a really good principle to follow if you work in legacy systems. Uh, it helps prevent regressions and collisions, and it allows you to add modifications very, very safely. So what it basically says is you can't change anything at its source. Imagine uh, it's, January, uh, it's January and you've written some buttons, and the buttons are built and you push them to the shared repository, and everybody's using the buttons. Then fast forward six months and it's June, and you want to change the padding on those buttons. That's gonna be very dangerous because you've got six months of work depending on a certain value. If you go back and change that button at its source, you're gonna have a big domino effect. You're potentially gonna break other people's work, uh, or you're gonna have to go through the entire site and check that everything's still okay. Going back to change things at source if they're already used is very, very risky. It's a bit like Semver or Git history. You know, once it's shared, you shouldn't really change it because it's, it's kind of dangerous. Um, so what we do is we, we add all of our modifications via extension. This avoids collisions and regression. Uh, it is probably the most useful principle when working with other people's, uh, other people's code. Um, so there is one time that we can go back and change things at source, one time and one time only. That's if there was genuinely a bug. So the only time a class uh, could be modified is to correct errors. If you literally got the buttons wrong in January, you go back, you change it, and then you are very diligent to go back and check the, uh, the, the sort of knock-on effect of that work. If, however, someone just wants a larger button, you cannot go back and change how the button behaves. You have to make a brand new class, and that class can reuse old styles via extension, oh, sorry, via inheritance. So for example, we've got a button, we decided the paddings, once that's out there, that's very, very risky to change it. We shouldn't go back and change how this button behaves. Um, we could do this then. We could say, well, okay, if the button's in this context, now we change it. Problem with this, um, it increases cyclomatic complexity. Um, we're modifying the button directly, so it violates the open-close principle. Um, we're mutating button, so this violates immutability. And again, the fix here is to use a BEM modifier, right? A really simple fix that, in that means that we don't get these collisions anymore. If we have to add a new class to our CSS, it means we have to add a new class to the HTML as well. It means we make a contract between our HTML and CSS so that we have to make two changes before anything happens. A change that can be made via CSS alone is very risky because it makes the change in one location and pushes out and affects the HTML. If we make a class in our CSS and refresh the browser, nothing's gonna happen because we have to open our HTML, put a class in there as well, then refresh the browser, then we see a change. So the open-close principle is all about adding new stuff via extension. It seems kind of counterintuitive. We are actually writing more and more CSS. It does lead to larger projects. But that's usually a worthy sacrifice uh, when compared with the other alternative, which is regressions, collisions, accidentally undoing other people's work. So yeah, a safe way to make changes. Everything gets opted into explicitly. It's this contract between your HTML and CSS. You have to add a class in both places. Um, it's a second layer of safety, that having that contract gives you that second layer of safety. And again, like I say, it's analogous to uh, rewriting Git history or using Semver. You can only go in one direction. Um, cool, the, I think, final principle, we're getting through a lot. The final principle is the principle of orthogonality. Who's heard of this one? Oh, very few people, cool. Orthogonality is quite an interesting one. Um, orthogonality is defined as uh, the ability to use uh, features of a language in arbitrary combinations and still get consistent output or consistent expected results. Now, this one's slightly less easy to apply to CSS. There are a couple of really good examples of how it works. Orthogon orthogonality is basically the ability to use this and this and this in whatever order and still get the same output, or use that and this and that in a different order and still get the expected output. 
What it does, or the reason it's good, is it reduces interdependence. If we know we can use things in random orders, it implies that they don't actually need each other in order to work. So not as dependent on each other, it makes for a very flexible system. It improves our composability. It means that we can put things together very safely and quickly because we know that we don't have to have things in a certain order. Um, it separates our concerns, reduces collisions. We'll look at an example of how it reduces collisions in a second. And it removes these side effects. A really good way of finding out if your CSS is orthogonal is if you can reorder your imports. If you can reorder your component imports and recompile your CSS and the page still renders the same, you've got very orthogonal CSS. Um, so orthogonal CSS is how well can we arbitrarily combine things. If the answer is very well, we can randomize our imports and still get the same web page as a result. It means we've got very interdependent CSS. Nothing relies on each other. This is a hallmark of a very, very good, very flexible system. We're striving for design systems now. Orthogonal CSS means that someone can use the button in a sidebar or in a modal or not use a modal at all or use a different style of button. They shouldn't have to worry about the actual CSS behind it. They should be able to implement things in whatever order they choose and still get the same output. Um, another good test of orthogonality is will it nest, right? Can we nest things? Uh, can we combine things in the DOM, actually in our HTML, with very little side effects or regressions? Hopefully, I've got a good example of this. It's quite a difficult example to step through in slides. Uh, but if we look at this HTML and CSS here, we'll see that um, we've got an H3, top left. We've got an H3, bottom left, with a class of testimonial title. But on the right, testimonial title is actually getting styled by promo H3. Because we've used a nested selector with an element on the end of it, uh, we've got this subtree collision. The selector promo H3 is actually able to step down the DOM into an unrelated component and start affecting it. This is an example of a mutation. This is uh, a sort of a not immutable. Um, so that's a bit of a problem. We've got a collision. The simplest way to fix these collisions, these subtree collisions, is again to just lean on the humble class. Now what we're doing is we've given the promo H3 its own class. We're not using a promo H3 selector. We're using a selector of promo title. Then we step down, we find that testimonial title is its own class as well. No more collisions, no more regressions. So writing well-scoped selectors leads to much more robust, uh, much better quality CSS. Using nested selectors, binding onto HTML elements in selectors leaves us open to these subtree collisions, which means that our CSS is no longer orthogonal. It means we can't nest things, we can't combine things in the UI without knock-on effects or side effects. Okay, just to close then, um, I still hear this all the time. Anybody else been told this? CSS isn't a programming language. Yeah, I hear this all the time. Uh, usually from naysayers who don't like putting classes in their markup. Uh, mainly true, it's not, right? CSS is not a program. No one's trying to make it a programming language. Uh, I'm not trying to say that CSS needs to have all these different features. It's still a compiled language uh, with so, you know, differences, or sort of subtle caveats with things like calc that gets sort of, render, uh, sort of calculated in the browser. But by and large, CSS is a compiled language. We're not introducing logic to CSS. Don't be afraid of borrowing paradigms and principles from different parts of, of the community, right? I, I gave this talk a couple of weeks ago, and someone said that, um, hey, this guy's just trying to make CSS into a programming language. I said, well, I'm, I'm just looking to other parts of our industry to get cleverer people to solve things for me. Don't be afraid to borrow things from other parts of the industry to improve our work. Uh, designers look to nature, right? Or architects might look to nature for inspiration there or to, to certain works of art. As front-end developers, it's really important to realize that people have been solving more complex problems for a lot longer than we have. Don't be ashamed or scared to beg, steal, and borrow from that part of the, uh, the industry just to make our work better. Sure, it's a little unconventional. It leads to uh, CSS that we're perhaps not used to writing, but it makes us much more effective and much more pragmatic. Uh, so with that, I just want to thank you all for your time. I think questions, taking questions. Is there a plan for questions? Anyone got any questions? Do we have time for them? Yeah, cool. Yep. Uh, Um, so, by and large, I am in favor of that, uh, as long as the implementation is nice and fast, which I'm sure it will be. Um, we've seen how they help us massively. I could never approach a project now without using a preprocessor. Um, yeah, move it into the browser. Uh, obviously, it'll be a, a while before we can actually use it everywhere. Um, but I, I'm in favor of it, as long as the implementation is nice and fast. Um, 
yeah, go for it. And in the meantime, obviously, we've still got preprocessors that compile down. We could use post-CSS to try and polyfill a lot of stuff. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm in favor of moving mix-ins, variables, et cetera, into the browser. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Oh, um, so yeah, ha if we're not binding CSS onto JavaScript classes, how do we actually style dependent on the JavaScript state, I guess would be a good way of summarizing. Uh, so, yeah, so um, the Node.js class on your HTML element, so start off with a blank HTML page which has a class of Node.js, N-O-J-S on it. And as soon as JavaScript is initialized, get rid of that, and you can nest things and say, I wonder if this will work. Uh, one second. So dot no js dot nav perhaps. Oh. I'm not a person for live coding. So yeah, if we've got no js, then style the nav like that. Any other questions? There was one near the front, I think. So uh that view you got from Cassandra, how is that better than the Cassandra element? And how can you make visual styling with JavaScript? Yep, so why would a class of text center be better than just using a center element? Uh, well, the center element is baked directly into your HTML, so you can't remove that, styles, uh, that styling. Um, it's not ideal, um, so yeah, a good, a good wider question would be, should we use utility classes at all? Uh, use them sparingly, use them to f fulfill that, you know, it needs to be live in an hour, just hack it for now. Um, we've gotta be pragmatic, right? We need to sort of, we need to get things moving. Um, so yeah, U text center is marginally better than um, using a center element. Uh, it's marginally better than using an inline style for very, very micro performance reasons, but it's still not great, right? So building UIs with uh, utility classes exclusively is unwise. I would not recommend that because we are beginning to move all of that style information. We are starting to move it back into the HTML. At least we are using different technologies for it. So the HTML isn't styling itself. We're using CSS in the HTML, which is a subtle kind of difference. But yeah, things like U text center, U float left, they should be used very sparingly, few and far between. I normally recommend use utility classes uh, for either very, very unique or implementation detail uh, styling. If anything's permanent, let's say all of your H2s need to be text line center all the time, do not use a utility class for that. Go and put text line center in your H2 rule set. Uh, so utility classes, they're not great. We should avoid them for as long as possible. Uh, but if we do need to use them, uh, they are marginally better than using center elements or inline styles. Any other questions? Uh, You're welcome. Mm -hmm. And uh, Uh, yeah, yeah, we, if you're gonna go like super granular, like very traditional BEM, yeah, 
we could encapsulate it all in one. I've run into plenty of occasions where we've had, the, exam the example I actually think of when I give this talk is, we had a bit of UI which was like a speech bubble thing, like a testimonial, and there was just one of them which had several testimonials that, sw that scrolled through, and we wanted a main testimonial on the home page, which was the exact same styles, but we just didn't want it to animate. We didn't want any kind of, we just wanted one static block of text. That was really hard to reuse that styling because as soon as we dropped the class in the HTML, it started trying to swipe through even though there was no text. So yeah, um, I think there are examples which cut it both ways. I've personally experienced examples where binding the CSS and JavaScript onto the same class was the wrong thing to do. But yeah, the nav example, I guess, is fairly cut and dry that if it's a responsive nav, you probably always want the behavior there. You can encapsulate it that way. Um, but I, advoc I personally advocate for keeping them as separate as possible. You can still have like the BEM style, your HTML, CSS, JavaScript, all in one kind of directory. But I, would st I personally would still use an extra hook for that JavaScript just to guarantee that I have got them separate. I may use them together 100% of the time, but I prefer the flexibility of being able to choose. Any other questions or comments? Right at the back. Yeah, so I guess it would be appropriate to talk from CMSs at this conference. Um, so I actually um, have a thing called, oh, I've turned my Wi-Fi off so I can't really get it. But um, So yeah, you've got like an app UI. It's got like a nav that's been built by a, a developer with classes. It's got sidebars, all of that kind of stuff that's been bit written by developers. You can get classes in there. And in the middle of it, you might have a section of content that's just raw HTML, no classes whatsoever. I just create a scoping element, like a, a div around that with an S hyphen blog post for a scope and just say, right, anything inside here, we start to use fairly unconventional CSS. So uh, class equals blog post space A element is going to be underlined now. So I would start to write traditionally bad CSS, but I would wrap it all in an extra container which says, I right, only style H1s this big if they're inside this. Um, so yeah, uh, if anyone wants to discuss that kind of stuff, CMS specific, um, I'll share a link to it after the talk, but just come and find me um, during the break or with a beer or something, because uh, that is a very good question. We can't always get access to the HTML. Any other questions? Yep, down there. You mean so it? Uh, it is, but they're not tied together. So I could still refactor. I could get the ULs and LIs out of the HTML and still have the classes for the nav link in there. And it would still work. I would have some redundant CSS that I might want to go and delete after that. But at least I can, I can refactor that HMO without having to look at my CSS file. So if we... Uh, probably should have done, I'm doing this the long way around, aren't I? Jeez. Uh, right, okay. So yeah, at least with this, I could choose to get rid of, let's see if I can use my laser. Yeah. It's so like I could get rid of this UL, this LI, and that class there will still work. It'll still work just fine. I haven't baked the DOM structure into the class name. I will be left with some leftover redundant CSS, so a diligent developer would go back and delete the references to site nav list and site nav item, but they are at least decoupled. I don't have to have ULs or LIs. I could switch. I could be really nasty and make this all divs and spans. Obviously, I wouldn't do that. Uh, Zeldman would come and find me when I'm sleeping. Um, but yeah, uh, we can refactor this at least. Uh, we're not baking it in. If I'd have named every class site nav list item link, then I would struggle, but at least they are fairly well decoupled. Any other questions? How much time have we got left for questions? A few more minutes? Four minutes for questions. Cool, right there. Oh, so switching to... Um, yeah, so, uh, come on. So the question is, how do I feel about ampersand nesting in, um, in SAS? Uh, I actually prefer the longhand method. So if we just do 
So yeah, uh, we can write stuff like foo uh, whoops, and underscore bar. So ampersand nest this in SAS, so we'd get foo underscore score bar generated. Good thing about this is that if foo ever changes to bav, uh, I can just do, and everything is just gonna propagate through. That's good. Bad thing about this is that the string bar, uh, baz underscore underscore bar doesn't exist anywhere in my CSS project now. If I want to grep for the string baz underscore underscore bar, I can't do that. Um, it doesn't exist in my project anymore. I would say optimize for your use case. If you're working in an environment where you do a lot of rapid prototyping, where class names change quite frequently, uh, this might be the best option. However, if you work in a legacy project where you're gonna spend a lot of time looking for styles, I would go and do it the longhand, like old fashioned way. Uh, I prefer this because I spend a lot of my time with clients who've got legacy. Um, but yeah, optimize for your use case. I don't think there's a better or worse. Uh, I just think it depends on the context. What a rubbish answer, it depends. Right, I think time for one more question, maybe. So I thought it was really interesting the way uh, you were talking about using using classes uh, instead of styling based on tagging, uh, I can add in filters and, and JavaScript activation filters. So I can try and push all that stuff into CSS. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So I think talking mainly about the HTML CSS thing, our industry has got a terrible habit for extreme overcorrection. We're like a big pendulum that can't ever find the middle. So in the '90s, we started off tables for layout, everything in the HTML, everything was handled by our HTML. Then the web standards movement, um, for all it was a fantastic thing and I'm glad it happened, it just swung the pendulum the opposite way, right? So now we're saying your HTML can be super clean, don't need a single class anywhere, put all of the complexity in your CSS. And like you say, we're just nudging it around, right? We're just moving this complexity from one place to another. I think what I'm trying to do and what people like, who, who advocate this kind of way of working, we're trying to find a balance. So we want semantic accessible HTML, which is why I mentioned always write your HTML first. But also we want to make sure that our CSS isn't a tangled mess. Uh, CSS is much harder to maintain than HTML is. Uh, yeah, HTML is just spat out by a templating system, by a CMS. HTML is inherently fairly cheap. Uh, so we need to just split the balance quite evenly. So I want to put judicious use of classes in my HTML, but I don't want to go as far as using color red, that kind of stuff. Uh, and I want to have nice sort of terse, well encapsulated CSS where the selectors are nice and sane. So I'm tr it's just basically that pendulum, it's just trying to find that middle bit. I'm not an advocate of using inline styles because that is too far the other way. Uh, so I think the balance, it, it, it is a balance and there are a few things pulling in different directions. But it's just trying to avoid that kind of severe overcorrection that we seem to be very uh, good at. Cool, I guess is that, is that kind of time? Cool, right, thank you all for your time. <laughs>